So, of course, for those of you who don't know, I'm Aaron Connor, uh, and this is Frank Hemming. We are part of a team of attorneys here, uh, and we practice in the areas of estate and trust, elder law, Medicaid, special needs, and guardianship. But today, we are focused on, on uh, Medicaid, and that's why Mr. Medicaid is here, Frank. <laughs> so, as always, we'll give a quick recap of our baselines, our eligibility, financial numbers, uh, how home care works, and what you do to really, to get there, right? You just don't walk into the DSS office and say, hey, I want some home care, boom, and there you have it. If only. Right? <laughs> well, then you wouldn't have your job. <laughs> Fine, I'll take it back. <laughs> With that in mind, uh, let's get rolling. So numbers, we like to recap this every, every Medicaid Monday, just because we don't know if this is your first time or your 20th time that you're seeing this, but there are new numbers for this year. Uh, they are up slightly from last year. So the numbers in front of you are where we currently sit. So for an individual at home, right, the, the type of people that we're focusing on today, the people that want to get home in their, in their, or home care in their homes, right, bring services into where they are. If you're a single person, your income limit went up to $1,752 per month, up from $1,697 last year, so a $55 increase to the good. And if you're a person at home, right, with uh, with your assets, we're going to talk about that on the next slide. If it's both spouses, a couple, that goes up to $2,371 for the household combined. Uh, again, up $83 from what it was last year. And then we have that, that third column or third row, if you will. Um, with that community spouse income allowance, that's the amount of money the community spouse can have if they are not seeking services for Medicaid, whether they're in home or the nursing home. Again, slight increase of $138 up to $3,853.50 because you can't forget the 50 cents here. <laughs> Why not just round up? Right? I don't know. So <laughs> just make our life a little easier. And then resources or assets, um, we kind of use those, those terms interchangeably. So for assets, again, you have a you have a limit just like for your income. Your asset limit currently for this year is thirty one thousand one hundred seventy five dollars. Again, up just a little bit from last year where it was thirty thousand one hundred eighty two. If you have that couple where we have both spouses applying, the combined resource allowance for the household went up almost fifteen hundred dollars, up to forty two thousand three hundred twelve. And again, that third row is the community spouse allowance. Again, that's the asset limit for the spouse who isn't applying for Medicaid, just shy of $75,000. That's been a much more static number, weirdly enough. So these are the numbers. That's where we are. And uh, it's always good to recap them. And lastly, uh, we're not uh, touching on uh, really what or the, the, term, uh, the times that we would use these, right? We use these mainly when we're calculating penalty periods for nursing home applications. Again, we thought it would just be good to continue to share this information. There were slight increases in the in the Medicaid regional rates for, for nursing homes when you're calculating a penalty period. However, uh, as we have said on uh, just about every Medicaid Monday since 2020, um, there is the, what we think, proposed change to the home care rules where they will institute a look back period. So if that happens, these are gonna be the numbers that they use to help calculate the penalty, just like they do for nursing homes currently. Again, slight increases across the board, you look at where that person's situated, you use that number, you do some division, and you get your penalty. But right now, still no penalty for home care. So again, just kind of sharing this information. So home care, right? So also called community care. Right? Community so Medicaid, sure. yep. Medicaid application, different than a chronic care. Yes, much, right. much different <laughs> in some ways, yes. So same asset limit, though. Yeah, I think that's confusing to people. But right. yeah, same assets, whether you're in home, in the nursing home, or in the select circumstances where you could have assisted living benefits, also same asset limit at 31,175 for one or the over $40,000 that we just went through just a few minutes ago. Right, well, the the few assisted livings that take Medicaid, it's considered a community application and not a chronic. Yeah, which... Um, but that's, I think that's a little strange, number right. one, because I don't think that makes logical sense to most people, right? right. I think if you were going to say, is a assisted living facility closer to a nursing home or closer to your home, people would say closer to a nursing home. Right. Uh, but for, for whatever reason, right, New York has decided to process assisted living applications as if they were home care applications. So again, no look back. 
Uh, if you're watching this and you're not in New York, I would say be mindful of, of what your state does because I was recently dealing with something for a family member. They are in Florida and I was informed that assisted living benefits in Florida are treated like nursing homes. So I didn't know that. So I can tell you New York does it uh, assisted living like home care, but other states might be different. Uh, and again, same rules for assets. So an IRA, if it's in periodic payment status, so or any really tax deferred retirement account, one vehicle, whether you're home or nursing home, uh, burial account, and a home if you're living in it or your community spouse is living in it. But or since this is a home care case, if you weren't living in it, it would not be <laughs> exempt. Uh, just to just to add on to that, right? We we usually mention this too. That doesn't mean that just because your house is exempt for qualification purposes, there are other things you might be want to do with planning. So by all means, if that if you want to look more into that or hear more about that, you can go back to our previous Medicaid Mondays to hear more about that. So to for someone to qualify for community Medicaid, they have to have issues, right? Yeah, you can't be doing cartwheels in your house and then ask the state to provide care for you, unfortunately. Right, and this has been one of the areas where the state has made it more onerous to to obtain Medicaid. Certainly, they've been they've been threatening to do that. Right, it's been two activities of daily living for quite some time. There was legislation that was being talked about for all the changes with um, the increased look back period and the other things that were happening in COVID in 2020. Um, it was proposed that they would increase the ADL limit to at least, or, or sorry, no, more than two, I think was the phrasing, which would mean, you know, three? at least three. <laughs> um, so far that has not come actually into practice. So for now it's still, you need activity, you need to require assistance with at least two activities of daily living. Uh, whether that three ADL requirement actually gets passed, not for us to say, obviously we'll be keeping an eye on it, but, uh, but yeah, you can't just need, you can't just say that you need help without medical proof. And again, to be helpful, thought it would be good to list what actually mm -hmm. constitutes an activity of daily living. I think most of these are pretty self-explanatory. These are the kinds of things that people would think about if we asked you, what do you think these things are? Right. So things like bathing or bathing, dressing, uh, grooming, eating, transferring out of chair, transferring out of bed, ambulating, and getting to the toilet and using the toilet. Uh, cognitive issues can also impact this, obviously. Yes, um, obviously. So one thing that we hear a lot when we're talking about getting the number of hours for people, uh, and maybe why they're not awarded the number of hours that they need, is that supervision is not an activity of daily living. Right. So there, there's kind of a, a gray area, if you will. Being in a house to supervise somebody at all times does not constitute an activity of daily living. However, if someone needs to be supervised while they are doing one of the activities of daily living, that is okay. And that should be something that's allotted for in your hours assessment. And prompted to do it, right? Right. That's a, and, Or if somebody needs to be prompted to do an activity of daily living. So for instance, if you have someone with cognitive issues. If they could dress themselves, if they could bathe themselves, if they could feed themselves, but they wouldn't know to do it unless you told them to do it, right? That also kind of fits into the criteria where there would be hours awarded that would qualify as needing assistance with an activity of daily living. Right. So again, kind of new, some nuance there, but biggest um, thing I think in general with this is a lot of times this is not what's in question, right? right? Most of the time when people need help, it's pretty self-evident that they need help with two of the activities of daily living, if not more. And that's not really the part of the process that we're usually concerned with, but right. obviously every case is unique. Right, not to say it's never been an issue, but it's usually not. Yeah, the other thing obviously um, is if we do think that there might be some uh, less than, you know, it's less than certain that they're gonna pass that requirement. Yes. We certainly can work with, a, with an outside professional, someone like a geriatric care manager, mm -hmm. where an assessment can be performed and we can kind of get a baseline as to their function, Correct. see if see how they're going to uh, appear while that's being determined, and maybe not go forward unless there's a change in circumstance. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's going to give us an idea of how many hours they would qualify for too. Which sometimes, most times, when people come to us, they've been in this situation for at least a short period of time. Yep. Sometimes it's been a long period of time, mm -hmm. and at that point, it's really an economic decision, right? Is it going to save money to do this? Almost always, yes. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. If you're paying for very little care, then maybe not. Yeah, all depends. Mm -hmm. So if you're over-resourced, which I think is pretty common when people come to talk to people like us, it's that 
they've heard from whomever, right? The mailman, the neighbor, could be DSS themselves right. in, in certain circumstances. But if you have too many resources, if you have too many assets, we then, then what can you do? Correct. So generally speaking, we will create a trust and we'll get into that. Then we will apply for home care because there's still no look back. Right. There's no penalty, so why not? Right. You can do a spousal refusal. Um, and sometimes we do that as well. It all depends on the circumstances. Yeah. Biggest thing with those are we're going to talk quickly uh, today on the, on the Medicaid trust, um, like the slide here kind of gives away. We did do a whole Medicaid Monday uh, for that back in uh, May, which I think it was me and you. I, I, I believe so. So if you, if you just want more Aaron and myself, you can go back to May and watch that one. There's a good way for anyone to go back. <laughs> Or um, we did do a whole, uh, in, in addition to spousal, mentioning the spousal refusal here, we also did do a Medicaid Monday on spousal rights and things in, in February. Uh, so if you want to go get more information about spousal rights, spousal refusal, what that means, what that looks like, again, there is a Medicaid Monday on that back in February. So here, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust is our vehicle, right? And why are we using that? We're using it for several reasons. Some people want to just give the money away that they're over by because there's no look back to their kids, to their whomever. It's a bad idea because if you ever end up needing nursing home care, you have to get it back and you have to get it all back. Yeah. Um, and it's Aaron, usually not there. I was going to say, Aaron, <laughs> I would say you're, the, you're the litigator in the firm, so I feel very comfortable asking you this. But I mean, if, if, if mom hands a, a big chunk of money to someone and says, <laughs> I'm giving this to you because there's no look back period for home care, but I need you not to touch it or do anything with it. Almost never happens. I was going to say, what's the likelihood that that's actually going to happen? Correct. We also want to keep assets out of probate because we may have a recovery issue, right? right? And what we mean by that is the government has a right to recover from your estate for the, the time that it, well, for the, the amount of money it pays out on your behalf, right? The longer you're on Medicaid, the more that amount is going to be and the less likely you really could want to pay it. So we, by using a trust, irrevocable or revocable, depending on the circumstances, but most often irrevocable, we're keeping assets from your estate and thus outside of being able to be recovered against. Could have said it better. Mm -hmm. so, so this type of trust, right, you appoint a trustee that manages your assets on your behalf, not you. Not you, not your spouse. Those are kind of the two big ones. Um, in very select circumstances, we've had people be their own trustee. But if there's if there's really any other, you know, combination of people, we never want to do that. You have to also name your beneficiaries in the trust, right? We have to name who this trust benefits. So typically, it would be the client during lifetime where they can have their income. So that would be your things like your interest, your dividends, things like that. If you have mm -hmm. stocks or other things, um, and then you have your heirs or your people that inherit at your death or at the at the grantor's death, the maker of the trust when they pass away. That's typically going to be children or grandchildren, but it could be could charities, be. it could be friends, it could be pretty much anyone of your choosing. You That's just right. have to kind of know who do you want things to go to if you were inheriting. We put a lot of different types of stuff in this trust. Uh, some of those things are listed there on the left-hand side of the slide. Obviously, it's not exhaustive. There could be other things, but Bank accounts, stocks, bonds, annuities, life insurance, if you have a business, if you have more real estate other than your home, those are all great things to put in a trust like this because not only does it avoid probate, it also gets that five-year clock ticking towards getting it safe from the nursing home. And it also ensures that if, again, if the plan kind of goes sideways, that if we have to get money or assets back to you, if we didn't make the five-year period, they're all sitting in this trust. So I think in general, this is our most flexible piece in our toolbox, if you will, make people eligible for Medicaid. And it's usually not nearly as scary or restrictive as people think once they kind of learn how it works. Right. And just another problem with outright gifts is basis issues. Yeah. Right. So if you gift your house outright to your children, they get a carryover basis, meaning whatever you pay for it. Whereas if you own it at death and this works inside the trust as well, they get a full step up to date of death value, which can be very beneficial. So Generally speaking, outright gifts are a very bad idea. Unless you like capital gains tax in that instance, <laughs> which you want to bring more tax. <laughs> Go right ahead. Um, so I think when we speak with people, they know that they can do things with their assets if they come to us, right? Most of the time, or at least they're not quite sure how, but usually right. they're, they, they, they know that there's something that can be done. 
what I hear the objection uh, or the misinformation of mom or dad is too much income. Right. And, and they, they don't know that there's a solution. For well, especially because your assets are, how, how do we put this, movable, right? They, they're, 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 they, right. they usually exist in such a form that things can be done to them, whether that's transfer them, liquidate them, spend them, whatever, mm -hmm. right? But things can happen. Right. With your income, your income is typically, it's your income. It's what you get. It's your social security check. It's your pension check. It's your required distribution from your retirement account. It's your dividends. It's things that you just happen to get in retirement, which just by being you and being alive. Right. And I think a lot of people, because of the, you know, of the, the lack of the ability to change much, that's where they think the disconnect really comes in. Well, you know, you might be able to do something with my house or my accounts or whatever, but my income is my income and you can't do anything with that. Right. <laughs> Which is wrong. Yeah. Because I think, I think, again, we're kind of setting the premise to be slightly different. We're not looking to change your income. We're not looking again, to hide your, your income. Your income can't is your income. You can't hide it. You can't change it. It is what it is. It's going to fluctuate slightly year to year. Cost of living, um, obviously, your retirement distributions from your IRAs are going to be dependent on your life expectancy. And if you have an annuity, it may go, go away at some point. Right. All sorts of things. So things can happen, but it's much, it's out of usual, your control as to what happens. So instead of saying, well, you're right, there's no, there's no answer <laughs> here. You're, you know, no Medicaid for you. Um, we do have several options. There, there's really one good one. Um, you can just spend down your income where essentially you take all the money above 1752 and you either spend it down on qualifying medical expenses, you know, like your prescriptions, your drugs, your home care, things like that. And then you have to prove to the county you do it every single month. Right. But that leaves you only with 1752 to live on, which most people could not survive in their house on such a small income. Right. Or you can take all the extra money and rather than spend it and figure all that out, you can just hand it to the county and say, here, this is yours. I don't want it anymore. But most people are even less likely to want to do that one. Right. So instead, we... We create fund something called a pooled trust or a pooled income trust. Right. Uh, it's a trust established by a charity or a nonprofit entity. And then the funds in the trust can be used for the person receiving home care for their benefit. And they can pay for all sorts of things. Big ones that people I think are usually concerned about would be your housing payments, whether it's rent or mortgage, additional food, clothing, entertainment, things like that, or additional home care. So if Medicaid doesn't give you every hour that you need, but you got close, and you have excess money to spend down, you can use your pool of trust to do that. But, but you can't, can't pay for duplicate hours. That's exactly right. That's that's illegal. Cannot do that. We cannot counsel you to do that. But we did do a whole Medicaid Monday on pool trust with Sarah Grimes from NYSARC. So again, if you have specific questions about pool trust, it's in the library. Go through that. So a Medicaid application is a document-heavy process. Uh, requires some time, some review. Home care a little different than a chronic care review. Yeah, we'll talk uh, about that. <laughs> but first you have to prove, well, there's a lot of documents, right? But you have to prove who you are. Yeah. Think, <laughs> Step think, one, right? Yeah. So obviously the take home point of this is be organized, right? If you're either yeah. going to apply for this or you think it's likely that someone you know will be applying for this, it's a lot simpler to get organized before you really start the process. Just because, again, when people come in to talk to people like us, Things usually aren't going the best. Right. Right. We're not seeing people on their best day. Correct. We understand that. Anyone who does this kind of work should be understanding of that. But at the same time, because you're going to need all these different things to actually complete the application, right? You're going to have a lot of things to do. Yeah. Right? You're going to have to track homework. down. Yeah. Exactly. Right. exactly. It, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's another job because it, it's hopefully it's not going to be nearly as long as that. Right. But you're going to have a new hobby for a little while. Yes. So it's much better to get organized before that all starts. And what do, what do we mean by there's a lot of stuff, right? You have to prove who you are, as Aaron said. So you have to prove your identity, your citizenship. So that's things like your birth certificate, your social security card, your driver's license. Most people know where most of this stuff is. And honestly, there's usually not one thing that if it's missing when it comes to the identifying documents, that's going to cause a problem right. for the local county. Well, yeah, we've had people who were born in other countries couldn't get their birth certificate. Yeah, or they've been destroyed. I mean, right. we there was once a client, I think, I think uh, there was a records fire with the VA, so like right. we couldn't get his DD-214 for something because right. it literally didn't exist any longer. But right. I think between like an affidavit and, and the news story, we were able to show the county, like, we know he's a vet. We can't right. prove it. Here's why. Right. Um, proof of residence, usually pretty easy. This is things like a utility bill, lease agreement if you rent. Like, right. you because know, you need to apply in the right county. 
right. is still county specific. Yeah. More than anything, this is exactly that's exactly right. More than anything, we're just trying to prove that you not only who you you are who you say you are, but we're <laughs> applying in the right place, and that the county we're applying to is actually the one that's going to be financially responsible for this person. Bigger, uh, biggest ones for there um, would be your income. You know, documenting your right. income because you do need to provide whatever your gross amount is. So. For instance, like you can't just use, and unfortunately you can't, you can't just use your bank statements for this. Correct. Because right? a lot of people have withholdings from their pensions or their social security or things like that, whether it's uh, health insurance premiums, uh, uh, tax withholdings, could be both, could be other, you know, sometimes there might be a little bit of life insurance benefit they have a withholding for, um, less common, but certainly have seen that. So it's more just making sure that you have all of your, your ducks in a row, you're getting all your income information, and your asset information. And just to just to kind of finish this thought, you can't use last year's taxes and your 1099s for this because we have to show what your current income is. And 1099s are previous year's income. So if it doesn't change, we might be able to use it, but it's not preferable. So just have that in mind, that's all. So once this is all done, we put it all together. Um, we then, uh, you know, we, so if we're working with somebody like us, right, we're gonna give you a checklist of all the necessary stuff. All the things we just kind of saw in that last slide, we're going to put it all together with the application, the main part of the application, or as I would say, the, the Medicaid application itself, that's much more personal in nature. That's mm -hmm. that you're identifying your stuff, that's your address, that's your social security number, that kind of stuff. There's a second part called the supplement A that details your financial data. That's all your accounts, your balances, and uh, potentially if there's any transfers for look back purposes, that kind of thing. So it's a big mess of paper. That all gets put together and then it gets submitted to your local county department of social services they're going to review the application they're going to have questions potentially and if they do they're going to come back with a document request or a clarification request with a deadline that says we need this information or we need to get this clarified or whatever by a certain date or we may deny your application you certainly don't want to be missing deadlines so if you're working with the department of social services please be mindful of that and this is a big thing that we that we as your attorneys, this is a big thing that we help you with because we deal with all of us. So this these usually get approved like in uh, what a couple of days? A week? Oh, I wish. <laughs> I wish. Uh, the unfortunate part of COVID um, is that we're still seeing, or since COVID, that's probably the better way to put it, is we're seeing delays, delays, delays all over the place. Um, the workers that are working are working very, very hard. I cannot say otherwise, but there's staff shortages everywhere still. It's Normally, it's supposed to be done within 45 days. Yeah. So if you have a non pool trust application, it's 45 days. Pool trust application is 90 days. And if it's before then, and you want to get checked in on with the application, a lot of times the counties will provide you an update. But other than providing just kind of a sense of what's going on, they're not really incentivized to move it forward anymore because Correct. there are probably a lot of people in front of you in the queue and they have a certain time. Once you get past the 45 or 90 days, there are some more options of what we can do to kind of get that moving forward. And at the time that the application also goes in, we're also doing your pool trust joinder agreement, getting any medical documentations in place. That way, hopefully that when the county worker looks at everything, everything's in a nice right. package and that they're not coming back and asking for all kinds of different stuff. Certainly they're going to, I don't know, enjoy is probably not the right word, but looking at our application more than someone who's put it in personally where they know it's going to have a lot of deficiencies. Yeah, I mean, the, the benefit of working with a professional that does this a lot is we do this a lot and we know what typically they're gonna to wanna to see, what they don't wanna see, what they don't need, things like that. So, you know, once we've got that financial approval, next we're gonna to go to the medical assessments, the care evaluation. We're not spending time on this because this is part one of our series. Part two is gonna talk about the medical side. Right. That's next month. Um, and also, I just feel like we need to say that People have come to us after they've filled out a Medicaid application falsely. Yeah. Okay. Love that. And you've certified on there that it's true. Mm -hmm. So that is a criminal act. So we strongly advise that if you do your own Medicaid application, you do it truthfully because it's a very, very easy crime to prove. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that we wanted to mention was what's the difference between nursing home and home care applications? We, we, we frequently get asked this question, so just kind of some ideas of how they're different. Well, we've said it a few times, there's no look back for home care. There is a 60-month look back for nursing care. Right. 
So for one, the stack of papers that goes into the DSS office is significantly larger with a nursing home application. Right. Because now you've got 60 months of statements on every financial account that's been in existence during that 60 month period. Mm -hmm. uh, other ones, obviously pooled trusts. Again, we talked a little bit in this program, you can't use a pooled trust in a nursing home. As much as that would be great, <laughs> but you can't do it. So if you're doing home care application, you have to worry about pooled trust, joinder agreement, medical documentation, disability determination, things like that. Don't need that with a nursing home application. And then the other last bullet, so I want to be careful just how we talk about this one. So essentially when we're working with people like us, there's typically no real reason to have retroactive benefits for home care purposes, just because of the way that that's actually done and structured through the budget. So for nursing home, typically we're asking for retroactive coverage up to three months plus the month of the application. For home care benefits, if you request retro benefits, because we're not seeing applications approved typically within or anywhere, or they're usually taking all those 45 or 90 days. That's a better way to put that. So if you get your approval and it's at least a month to two months, maybe even three months after submission, if you request retroactive coverage for home care, usually the only thing the county's going to do is they're going to turn around, decrease your spend down and have you deposit less to your pool trust and pay other medical bills with it. So it doesn't usually save you any money to do that. It's not really beneficial. It right. essentially doesn't exist. Yeah. When you're when you're using a when you're using a pool trust, retroactive doesn't really work because it's just decreasing your pool trust contribution and forcing you to make payments to to certain qualified expenses when maybe you want to use that money for other things. So, right. But again, nursing home, we are usually going retroactive. So again, big difference. Um, and that's it, I think, for today. That's right. So there will be another Medicaid Monday on August 12th.